started. So are there any questions on the material so far? Any questions? Okay, so last time we discussed different ways of conceiving of the causes of death, uh, with a particular emphasis on health behaviors, and uh, focusing initially on obesity. And we discussed the patterning of obesity by race, sex, and income, and we talked about various determinants of obesity, what might be contributing to the epidemic of obesity in our society, including, for instance, the idea of, a, of changes in social norms. And finally, we began to discuss some sorts of policy interventions at diverse levels that could be introduced in order to respond to the obesity epidemic, in which I'm sure you've already foreseen, could be more broadly applicable to other sorts of public health problems, including the top uh, counter-marketing campaigns, legislation, uh, and different kinds of community interventions, and so forth. And I want to reiterate one of the points I made last time about non-discrimination especially given the, some of the images of obese individuals that are a necessary part of understanding this topic. Because the point of the picture of the woman in the pink uh, bikini was not to make her an object of derision or even an object of pity, but rather to show the difficulty that is faced in facing this epidemic, on the one hand, by recognizing the very real and material health consequences of obesity, but doing so in a way that isn't sort of stigmatizing or harmful to the relevant individuals. And this is a challenge, not only rhetorically, how do we speak about this topic without you know, being scientifically accurate but not mean-spirited, uh, and also uh, practical, because it, how you address it, for instance, it cannot, it's not necessarily a good thing, as we'll see today, uh, the progressive changes regarding attitudes or normative beliefs about smoking in our society have no doubt contributed to the decline of smoking. And to the extent that we've become more accepting of obesity, it's quite likely that's contributed to the prevalence of obesity. And yet at the same time, we wouldn't want to advocate a policy that says, be less accepting of people who are obese. So it's a very difficult uh, area to wade into, not just in terms of how you teach it, not just in terms of how you speak about it, but how you craft effective uh, public health policy if you're going to tackle some of these topics. So today, as I foreseen, as I forecast, we're going to be speaking about uh, uh, guns and alcohol and, and tobacco, uh, and, uh, and mostly about tobacco and secondarily about guns and some, uh, at least about alcohol today. And once again, this is the slide we introduced the last time that starts to introduce the idea that we can configure the causes of death in two completely, at least two completely different ways uh, uh, in, in this class. And we started the first five or seven lectures, we're focused on the left, and now we're shifting to begin to think about things as they're arranged um, on the right. And as we saw the last time, tobacco is in fact the leading killer uh, in the United States. So the diseases caused by tobacco take nearly half a million lives. About two and a half million people die every year in our country, at all ages and of all causes, and uh, about a fifth of them uh, die from tobacco-related uh, diseases, which is really a, unbelievable if you think about it. If tobacco didn't exist, we'd be so vastly healthier if we just didn't have this one plant that we consume by burning and uh, inhaling. Uh, and it's a leading killer despite the fact that cigarette consumption has in fact been declining since 1960. So if you think it's bad now, it was even worse uh, 50 years ago. And the reason for this is that despite the decline, the reason that it's still such a bad killer is that we're nowhere near where we were 100 years ago. And this slide shows tobacco consumption measured in number of cigarettes per person per year across you know, something like the last 100 years. So 100 years ago, there was always some tobacco consumption, but it was modest. It was not a huge deal. Uh, and it's gradually rising in the early part of the century, and then here it declines during the Great Depression, primarily for economic reasons. It's a luxury good, after all. Uh, and then there's a steady rise up until the Second World War, and then an initial uh, and a further boost as the GIs come home. Uh, you know, to, during warfare, especially nicotine consumption uh, goes up. Uh, and the initial concerns about cancer, smoking being linked to cancer, uh, Sir Richard Dahl begins to discover this work, or do this work in England in the late 1950s. So already the epidemic was quite high of tobacco consumption when these discoveries start being made. And it takes quite a number of decades before this science begins to filter down into and begin to affect public policy. The first Surgeon General's report is in the late 1960s at the peak of the epidemic, and then gradually things are beginning to uh, improve. 
and you begin to have a progressive uh, institution of a variety of movements in our society, public health and social movements, including non smokers rights movements and so forth. You begin to have legislation like that, a, a, a ban on broadcast advertising. You used to see tobacco ads on television. Uh, I mean, I, I, think, I can remember those from Maryland. I was a little boy. Uh, and these gradually go uh, decline. Uh, federal taxation, different kinds of public health interventions we'll be discussing today, directed at driving down, feeding back this epidemic. But even so, we're nowhere near where we were 100 years ago in terms of tobacco consumption. And in fact, there are nearly 50 million smokers in the United States today, and the prevalence of smoking among adults is 25 to 30 percent. And the average consumption is over 2,000 cigarettes per year, or about a third of a pack per day uh, of tobacco in our society. In fact, if you look more closely at the last 10-year period, uh, and also looking at the patterns by age, we see that there is a that this recent decline in tobacco consumption has not been uniform across age groups. So the youngest age group, your age group, 18 to 24, has actually, the last 10 years, been decreasing uh, over this time period, though still about 20% of people in your age group um, are smokers. Now, you guys are more educated than the average 18 to 24-year-old in the United States, so you have a lower prevalence than that, but still some goodly number of you, 5 to 10 percent, are probably smokers. So here is the age group uh, over here that's been declining in your age group over time. And here's the overall trend over here. Uh, it's been a very gentle, slow decline in the last 10 years. It's still around 20 percent uh, across all ages, just over 20 percent of Americans are smokers. And among those that are among the young, those that are minorities and those that are in lower SES are more likely to initiate smoking and less likely to quit once they've initiated uh, smoking. Well, why does tobacco kill you? How exactly is it that tobacco kills you? And nicotine is the key addictive component of the drug, of, of tobacco. It's a highly toxic substance in itself, but it's really not the nicotine that's so dangerous. It's all the other stuff that's in tobacco that's so much more dangerous. And actually, cigarette smoke has over 4,000 chemicals and at least 50 known carcinogens or other harmful substances in it, including tar, cadmium, and lead, and cyanide, things that anyone on the street should recognize. I mean, heavy metals are toxins. A cyanide, everyone knows, is a, is a poison. Uh, nitrogen oxides, benzoepyrenes, carbon monoxide, not a good thing uh, from the incomplete combustion of the tobacco. You always get some carbon monoxide. Vinyl chloride, acetaldehyde, sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide is, uh, is, uh, is the very strong base. Uh, it's often used in cleaning uh, products, uh, hair removal products, and so forth. And, uh, and these substances, these toxins, damage tissues throughout the body in many different ways and affect multiple organs and increase the risk of cancer and many other diseases, that we, as we've been discussing intermittently uh, throughout the class. And in addition, the combustion of the cigarette, which typically at the tip of the cigarette it's over 1,000 degrees, as the cigarette burns, releases thousands of toxic gases and particles, which are very quickly absorbed into the body. When you inhale them, either through the mouth or through the nose, or they land on the skin. That's one of the reasons that people who smoke have more wrinkled skin. is It's not just because of the substances going into the body. It's the, the fact that you're bathing your skin in, in, uh, in these toxins. And the, and the organs involved in the absorption of the smoke, such as the lungs and the vascular system, and in the excretion of the wastes from, that you ingest, uh, in, uh, get a very high exposures uh, to these toxins. So the impact is very widespread, causing multiple diseases and insults to many parts of the body. In fact, smoking and nicotine arouse very strong physical and emotional reactions, feelings of pleasure and relaxation and alertness, People who are smokers will tell you things that would seem incompatible to those of us that are not smokers, that it makes them both more alert and more relaxed. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's, it's like a wonder drug when, when you hear people describing it. And it take, typically takes between 10 and 19 seconds for the nicotine in a cigarette to reach the brain and stimulate the release of all sorts of neurotransmitters. So this nicotine, uh, it's a small hydrocarbon, it goes into your body, it circulates through your bloodstream, and it hits the brain, and it's like, it's a drug. It hits you, and it affects you very rapidly. And this rapid behavioral, uh, and the rapid behavioral reinforcement from the fact that when you smoke, you get this appealing uh, sensation, uh, reinforces and enhances the addiction. So nicotine causes the release of serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and leads very rapidly to neuroadaptation, meaning that you get used to it, and you need more and more of it to give you the same effect. 
So raise your hands if you drink coffee. Okay, remember when you first started drinking coffee, you'd have a cup of coffee and it really, you got a jolt out of it. It made you feel good. By the way, most of the scientific evidence amazingly shows that there's very little of any damage we can find from drinking coffee, astonishingly. Uh, so you can be secure. I'm not going to say anything bad about coffee in this class. Um, and, and actually, I hate coffee. I just can't even, the smell of it is disgusting to me. But, uh, and I'm very fortunate to have married a woman who just by serendipity also hates coffee. I think we would have gotten divorced early on if she was a coffee. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> also, I never liked beer, and she doesn't like beer. We're very, very sympathetic in a number of ways. But anyway, uh, so, but, but there's nothing bad about coffee, actually, as far as, by and large. But nicotine is really bad for you. And, um, and uh, uh, so, but anyway, so when you first had coffee in your lives, you probably felt a good jolt from the coffee. And now, in college, you probably feel like you have to have four or five cups of coffee in order to get the same effect you got from a cup of coffee when you were 16. And that's neuroadaptation. That's your body upregulating uh, receptors that respond to the caffeine, and, uh, and you need more and more of it to get the same kind of hit uh, that you had uh, before. And, uh, and, when neuro, and as neuroadaptation sets in with respect to nicotine, the brain develops uh, more nicotine receptors, and so requires increasing amounts of nicotine to achieve the same effects. And the constant amount of nicotine seems to give less and less of a rush, and the brain gets used to nicotine and ultimately needs the nicotine just to function normally. And in fact, that's what makes it so hard to quit. It's really, really, really hard to quit smoking, even after you get a, a, a shock, a, a substantial health shock, like you have a heart attack or, or lung cancer. So I, I mean, this is, people tell this story as if it's apocryphal, but I've actually had this experience when I was a house officer working at the Veterans Administration Hospital at the University of Pennsylvania, we would have a vet, an uh, older man who was a veteran, who came in with lung cancer and had his lung taken out, one of his lungs, and was still getting radiation therapy uh, and, uh, and was, uh, had a, a tracheostomy tube that was in here, and we would find him outside the hospital smoking by putting the cigarette into the tracheostomy tube. You know, the little hole in his neck with the tube that went into his trachea. He was sucking uh, the, uh, the tobacco through. He was desperate to get his hit, even though he knew how bad it was. He had just had this, uh, this evidence. So people are trying to quit. At least 70% of smokers want to give up. Each year, nearly 35 million people make a concerted effort to quit smoking, but less than 7% stay smoke-free for a year, and most start smoking again within days. It's very dispiriting, actually. 40% of heart attack smokers relapse while still in the hospital within two days of intensive care. You have a heart attack. You almost die because of your tobacco. Then you're put in the hospital, and literally almost half of you start smoking again in the parking lot on the way home. 50% <coughs> of patients with laryngectomies try smoking again. That's if you have your voice box removed due to head and neck cancer. 50% of patients with lung removed for lung cancer smoke again. And more than half of heroin and cocaine users and alcoholics rate smoking harder to quit than cocaine, heroin, or alcohol. That's how hard it is to get off tobacco uh, once you start. And in fact, there have been a number of studies looking at how addictive nicotine is. This slide shows the results of a study of the subjective and physiologic effects of intravenously administered cocaine and intravenously administered nicotine, which were compared in 10 cigarette smoking cocaine abusers. So they found people who were both tobacco smokers and cocaine abusers, and they put needles into them and they gave them IV cocaine and IV nicotine. And this was unlike the sweet saccharin study we talked about last time where they used rats or mice to do the experiment. These are real people that are being given intravenous, uh, you can't sign up for this study, uh, being given, uh, <laughs> given this study. And under double-blind conditions, subjects received placebo, cocaine at three different doses, and nicotine at three different doses in a mixed order. And physiologic and subjective data were collected before and repeatedly after intravenous drug administration. And, uh, and what they found was that the nicotine high and rush were rated as stronger than cocaine. Stronger than cocaine. Although the nicotine was less jittery in the, in the subjective experience of the subjects. And nicotine has a more rapid onset of subjective effects. They felt more rapidly after they got that, they felt better. And it was frequently misidentified by the substance users as cocaine. So it's a really powerful drug, uh, nicotine is. And the tobacco companies were explicitly aware of the addictive properties of nicotine uh, and the efficiency with which cigarettes could deliver nicotine right from the beginning. 
And as a result of lawsuits launched against the tobacco companies in the 1990s, an enormous trove of documents was disgorged by the tobacco companies, as outlined in Alan, a historian Alan Brandt's wonderful book called The Cigarette Century. He was a, one of my teachers, actually, Alan was. And thus, we have access to numerous internal company documents. Here's one comment from 1972. Uh, this is internal tobacco company documents. The cigarette should be, should, should be conceived not as a product, but as a package. The product is nicotine. Think of the cigarette pack as a storage container for a day's supply of nicotine. Think of the cigarette as the dispenser for a dose unit of nicotine. Smoke is beyond question the most optimized vehicle of nicotine, and the cigarette the most optimized dispenser of smoke. Right from the beginning, these companies knew how harmful this product was and how addictive it was. This is another document. To account for the fact that the beginners, beginning smoker will not tolerate the unpleasantness, we must invoke a psychosocial motive. Smoking a cigarette for the beginner is a symbolic act. Remember, we're talking about religion having symbolic implications. Now, tobacco is having symbolic implications. The smoker is telling his world, this is the kind of person I am. Surely there are variants of this theme. I am no longer my mother's child. I am tough. I am not a square. This is an old-fashioned term. I am not a square. <laughs> Whatever the individual intent, the act of smoking remains a symbolic declaration of personal identity. So it's the perfect fusion, like exploiting human weaknesses at every level, exploiting our, weak, our, our brain's susceptibility to addiction, exploiting our like, social insecurities. This whole industry was built on, on tapping into people's weaknesses and ultimately being the leading killer of Americans then and still to this day. And indeed, tobacco companies have become experts in the psychosocial aspects of growing up since so much of their business is bound up in understanding how to motivate young people to start smoking, despite the fact that for many, individually at least, it's gross uh, at the beginning. And they understood that the young smokers soon get addicted to the nicotine. Here's another document. As the force from the psychosocial symbolism subsides, the pharmacological effect takes over to sustain the habit. Completely aware of the fact that first we're going to get you to do it because you think it's cool, and then you're going to be stuck because you can't uh, stop it. And we care about tobacco not only because it kills its users, but also because it kills so-called innocent bystanders. And this is a really important idea when it comes to smoking, an idea which, can, uh, be, which is actually illustrates a variety of issues in public health, including the issue of externalities, moral hazard, and, and the appropriate public policy response. <coughs> Because tobacco didn't just kill the people who, quote, chose to use it, it also killed other people who were innocent uh, bystanders. And similar phenomena of secondhand effects, or these externalities, obtain with other behavioral causes of death, such as accidents. You know, if you're driving recklessly, we care not just because you could kill yourself, although we care about you, but also because you could kill other people. And that's why the state has a right, at a minimum, to get involved. As soon as you start killing others, it's unquestioned the state can get involved. The debate is only ever whether the state can get involved to stop you from killing yourself. Uh, or alcohol use or sexual behaviors similarly can harm others. And we'll talk about these later on in the course as well. But in terms of secondhand smoke, the inhalation of smoke that others have exhaled, it itself was classified as a carcinogen in 1993. It also contains over 4,000 chemicals and 50 known carcinogens. 60% of non-smokers in the U.S. have biological evidence of secondhand smoke exposure. Just inhale the smoke that someone else has exhaled. Uh, it causes 3,000 lung cancer deaths. This inhalation of secondhand smoke causes 3,000 lung cancer deaths and 35,000 heart disease deaths every year. Just people die every year from inhaling other people's smoke. And it causes between 8 and 26,000 new asthma cases in children every year perhaps as many as 300,000 bronchitis and pneumonia cases in babies every year, and two hours spent in a smoky bar are equivalent to smoking four cigarettes yourself. So when you inhale other people's smoke, you get all the, a substantial uh, exposure. And this phenomenon was critical in the movement against tobacco. Because smoking imposes these externalities, this became a very powerful and useful uh, lever uh, for regulation. Now, this is not obviously present in the case of obesity. 
it's not clear in the case of obesity what an obese individual's, what an individual's choices about their body size, how it might adversely affect others. But with the case of smoking, it was clear in the case of alcohol, the sexual behavior, it's clear. And so the, the lines, the policy regulatory lines are a bit clearer in this case, in the obesity case. But the addictive properties of cigarettes and the issue of harmfulness of secondhand smoke were the key facts that have motivated a public health response to smoking, focusing on the structure and not just on the agency. So now I can say, OK, not only does your choice affect others, so it has these structural effects, uh, but also, your agency is compromised. You're addicted. You can't help but smoke. And so actually, that provides me some legitimacy in intervening to protect you from yourself. Well, what are some of the ways to respond to this menace at the population level? How can we address the structure of the problem and not just the agency involved, especially if addiction is compromised, uh, has compromised this agency? And how can we do this especially given the collective and not just individual risks that the behavior imposes. So there are at least four types of public health responses to tobacco, which we're going to review. One has to do with taxation. So you change the economics of the, of the practice, so you make it more expensive. Counter-marketing, which we introduced the, la introduced the last time and we'll talk a little bit about today. Uh, sort of uh, trying to use marketing techniques uh, to change public behavior. Laws regarding clean indoor air, so different types of regulatory regimes and smoking cessation programs, which can be administered on a bigger scale. So I'm not so much talking about when you see your doctor and your doctor does something for you, if he or she prescribes a medication or treats you clinically, I'm interested in sort of broader public health smoking cessation programs. So let's talk first about the cost of buying cigarettes. And the large, as most of you know, a large part of this cost is in fact taxes. But the rate of cigarette taxes varies very, very substantially from one year of a decade or so ago, it ranged from two and a half cents per pack in Kentucky to a uh, hundred times as much, two dollars and five cents per pack in New Jersey. Big differences in the taxation uh, of tobacco from place to place. And the national average in 2004, 10 years ago now, was 66 cents was the national average per pack. And some municipalities add further taxes so that, for example, a pack of cigarettes purchased in New York City in that time frame cost $7. Now it's, of course, more. And overall, however, cigarette taxes are actually, even though they might seem high now, are actually not at uh, historical uh, highs. So this slide shows the rates of smoking and of excise taxes. And so here's the real excise tax in real dollars. Here's the relative rate across time. And actually, excise taxes declined over the course of the 70s and 80s and have sort of begun to go back up again over the last 10 or 20 years. And here's the per capita smoking. So per capita smoking hasn't just began to decline, as we saw a few slides ago, you know, 30 years or so ago. This is after being uh, for a while. This is from 1960. Of course, before then, uh, we saw the big run-up that we saw a few slides ago. So taxes have been going up a little bit over the last time period, but still aren't as high as they used to be. And it turns out that numerous economic studies have documented that the purchasers of cigarettes are actually very sensitive to the price of tobacco. And this is very important. Every 10% increase in the price of cigarettes results in a 4% decrease in use. That's a really powerful effect. If we doubled the price of tobacco, we could actually probably significantly lower consumption uh, in this country. And this gives us a very effective public health lever in which to effectuate behavioral change. Here are the results from a specific study looking at the effect of taxes on the smoking cessation habits of pregnant women. So if any person would, could be, more, it's hard to imagine a person who would be more motivated to, to quit smoking than a woman who's pregnant has a baby inside her. So during her lifetime, that would probably be the moment when she would be most interested in trying to get off uh, tobacco. And prenatal and postnatal smoking has significant detrimental effects on children's health. In fact, prenatal smoking accounts for 20% of the low birth weight babies and is the most important modifiable risk factor for poor pregnancy outcomes. So women who smoke have smaller babies and other problems uh, with their babies. And postnatal smoking exposure of small children doubles the risk of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome that we discussed earlier in the course, and is a major risk factor for respiratory illness, middle ear problems, and asthma in children, little babies inhaling the smoke that their parents are exhaling. This figure compares the prenatal quit rate, the ability of women to quit while pregnant, 
for women in New York and Washington State, where cigarette taxes were raised early in the sample period to the quit rate for similar women in six states that did not raise the taxes. And as the figure illustrates, the quit rate in the two different states, in the two different affected states, rose by approximately 15 percentage points between 1994 and 1996, while the quit rate for the unaffected states remained relatively constant. So this is a study in the NBR working paper that looks at the percentage of pregnant women who are quitting. And here are the states, here's a sample of states where there's no change in status, it's sort of a flat line. And here New York and Washington at these time periods pass some laws or raise some taxes. And you see that the quit rate goes up in those states. And the argument is it's because cigarettes have become more expensive. And this very sensitive population, primed to quit, sensitive to price, actually starts quitting when you raise up the price. And next, the authors directly estimated the effect of cigarette taxes on quit rates using the same changes in state cigarette taxes to identify the effects. And they found that a 10% increase in cigarette taxes increases the probability of a woman quitting smoking during pregnancy by 10%. So a higher rate than the general effect that I mentioned a moment ago, again, presumably because pregnant women are really primed to want to quit. So 10%. Increase in taxes, 4% reduction in smoking in the general population, 10% increase in taxes, 10% uh, decrease in smoking in the population of pregnant women. And of course, from a public health point of view, two people benefit here, both the mom and the baby. And the authors estimate that a 30 cent increase in taxes would have approximately the same effect on quit rates as enrolling women in prenatal smoking cessation programs. So rather than actually having to spend money to get the women into programs to get them to quit, you can just have an even hand at across the board, 30 cent per pack tax, and then we'd have this just as much public health benefit. So taxes work really well, really, really well, when it comes to people's behavior in general, but especially when it comes to tobacco. So people are motivated uh, by money. Unfortunately, they're also motivated by sex. And the tobacco industry has a long history of using it to, uh, to sell uh, uh, tobacco. So, um, so one internal memo from uh, Camel said, uh, Camel Cigarettes, said Camel's goal of trend influence marketing is to attract and convert smokers in the trend setting urban scene. And it will have a lasting impact on club goers who will begin to associate Camel with what is cool. And so they have images like this, you know, typically of uh, most often women, but also men, who are scantily clad or otherwise attractive. Uh, and they kind of play out, in the case of Camel, the exoticism uh, of, the, um, of the tobacco product. Uh, and you know, here it says, what you're looking for, uh, this woman, uh, you know, if she's consuming menthol uh, tobacco. And here's some ads presumably targeted at young women. Uh, even the girl with the dragon tattoo is foreseen by these older ads. Uh, so this is obviously a much older ad that, uh, you know, from, from the 1970s. Pleasure to burn, it says here. Uh, here it says be bold for this woman. So she's obviously, you know, she's not even wearing a bra. And uh, she's wearing these little, uh, whatever, these little leather cufflinks. Not cufflinks, uh, what are they called? Cuffs are. And uh, she's smoking and she's very cool. She has this tattoo. Uh, and here's, here's this woman here, uh, you know, who is getting a, a light from this guy. You know, you guys don't need my explanation for why these things are ostensibly attractive. Uh, but, you know, this obvious attempt to capitalize on sexuality as a means of, uh, of selling this product, you're targeted uh, to women. And here's some, uh, some further ads targeted to women. Smoking can be seen as a way to get men uh, or a way to get thin uh, while, eating, while eating french fries. So this woman is saying, if I ran the world, calories wouldn't count. Look, she's smoking, and this guy's handing her a big plate of fried food. Lucky her, she can eat that and have her tobacco. Uh, this woman here is the slimmest slim in town, Capri. Again, suggesting that smoking, you know, feeding into the idea if you smoke, which is true, if you smoke, you're thinner. Uh, but, you know, that's how to exploit people's uh, insecurities about their body, for instance. And here this woman says, slow down, pleasure up, in a kind of sexually ambiguous uh, pose and, uh, and word choice a pattern that's widely repeated uh, in, um, in tobacco advertising. Actually, cigarettes can also be seen as a way to replace men, not just get men. This woman can have a cigarette. Until I find a real man, I'll take a real smoke. Wow. You know. <laughs> Good for her, you know. Uh, 
So, you know, it really plays both sides. You know, you can use the tobacco to attract a man, you can use the tobacco to replace a man. It's, you know, good for what ails you, is uh, sort of the uh, argument that the tobacco companies are trying to portray. Again, showing this uh, powerful young woman who is very confidently striding, and these other men in their awkward shorts and their little baseball caps, you know, receding into the distance unappealingly because she, these are not real men. Uh, she, you know, she can have what she really wants. Um, and these ads seem more targeted at men, though it is unclear whether guys are such dopes that they would really fall for this stuff. Uh, so on the far left, although these are female pictures of women, uh, the, ad, the ad is pitched to, to men. Here it says, would you walk a mile for me? This, this is 1970s vintage makeup and appearance. Uh, here it says, what you're looking for, uh, the woman says in the middle. And here, blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> 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 um, so for women, for women, uh, smokes can replace men, but for men, uh, they can lure women. Talk about arming both sides. You know, I'm smoking to keep you away. You're smoking to lure me to you. You know, whatever your ideology is about tobacco, we're going to sell you a product and going to persuade you that this product is going to fix your problem, uh, whatever it might be. Here's the famous cool Joe Camel campaign, targeted primarily at men, uh, one thinks, especially given the phallic imagery in the uh, Joe Camel's face. If you haven't seen this before, I hope I've got the first person pointing this out to you, nor that I need to describe for you what this looks like. Uh, but all you know, he has a very prominent uh, nose, uh, Joe Camel does, uh, in all of these images. And, you know, he's a very cool dude, uh, is the argument uh, about uh, Joe Camel. Now, counter-marketing campaigns uh, actually seek to use the same kind of techniques that I very quickly illustrated in the last three or five minutes and that are described in the readings for today seem to use these same techniques, especially involving sex and humor, to make tobacco less desirable. And we saw a bit of this the last time with respect to obesity and then some other crazy things at the end. Here's just a few examples with respect to tobacco of counter-marketing campaigns. Starting with Joe Camel, uh, we can have, you know, Joe Chemo. Uh, you feel sorry for Joe Camel? Uh, you know, here he's taking off his glasses, he's getting intravenous chemotherapy, there it is, it also kind of looks like urine. His, uh, you know, he's sort of visibly, his nose is deflated. Uh, here, here he is again, uh, Joe Chemo, uh, you know, with all the other Joe Chemos uh, walking down uh, the street or the hospital court. Or here is a revised take on the Marlboro Man. So, you know, here his penis is very prominent in the image. Uh, at Marlboro, here impotent, and you know, you can see his, uh, you know, his, uh, you know, the limp, uh, you know, cigarette. Because tobacco does contribute uh, to vascular disease, and it does ultimately contribute to impotence. And people may not know this, and you're using sex and humor uh, and a little fear uh, to try to like play off of the same you know, kinds of uh, tropes that were used to try to get people to use the tobacco. Um, and there are other examples. Here are other examples of kind of marketing campaigns. So this shows a little plate uh, or an ashtray with a fork and a knife. And it says, want some wet chicken? Sounds really gross. That tastes the same. And here it says, does smoking make you hard? You see this little sort of penis image here? Does smoking make you hard? Not if it means you can't get it up. And this is the National Health Service. You'll notice the yellow fingers from the tobacco. And this says, autopsy du meurtier. So, um, you know, an, an autopsy of a killer. And it shows all the various deadly components of the tobacco. So these would be some initial uh, counter marketing campaigns that play off of the same kinds of things that the tobacco says, oh, use this product, you'll be attractive and virile. Actually, no, use this product, you'll be unattractive and not virile. Let's use those tools uh, against you. And these counter-marketing campaigns also sometimes take advantage of the health externalities of secondhand smoke. So, uh, so this image here on the far left, you can't read it, but it says, extinguishing lives, passive smoking impairs the respiratory health of hundreds of thousands of children. And in the middle, it says, secondhand smokers are on the worst side of the cigarette. When you, uh, over here, so she's on the worst side, you see it's put in backwards. The fire is inside her mouth, so that's supposed to be a little bit shocking. And here, you have this very innocent looking fetus 
uh, of course, made from the swirls of tobacco smoke. And the caption says, uh, when you smoke, your baby smokes. And as we saw with the responsiveness of young mothers in the earlier taxation study, this type of advertising campaign may be particularly effective at targeting young parents, especially women uh, who are pregnant or have small children, although also, in principle, fathers who have small children uh, at home. Any questions so far? <coughs> Yeah, so there's, there's changing science in this area. It depends a little bit on how much you smoke and how long you smoke. But a rule of thumb is that five years after you quit smoking, on average, your health risks return to baseline. Some studies say they never return to baseline. Some studies say it depends a lot on when you stop and when you start and how long you smoke and so forth. But yes, you can, you can return to health if you stop smoking after a number of years. Yeah, what's your name? Joel. Yes, yeah, sex, the counter market. Yeah, I think, I think we'll have some examples in a moment. I mean, the impotence one is implicitly, most people think of that as a sexual issue. Uh, so this is implicitly using sex, I mean, not in a, oh, in an appealing way, making non-smokers seem sexy. Uh, see, I'd like to note that. Let's see if we can find some stuff, some images for next year. I don't think I have any images, but yes, people have them. Or if you find any images, send them to me. Other, other questions? Yeah, Matt, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're in the plant in part, but also in the processing. The, the procedures used to prepare the tobacco and cut it and roll it and stuff uh, contribute additional things. Yeah. Why is um, Cal Rosario, right? Mm -hmm. Why is there more than some states than others? Like, I'm from California, and Chile, there's like taboo, but in other parts of the country, Yeah, so different states have different cultures, and they have different legislative uh, priorities, and so, you know, they're different postures. The tobacco growing states tend to be much more permissive about tobacco. That's why the tax in Kentucky was two cents, and New Jersey was two dollars. Uh, so it varies from place to place. But the, the claim in the article that I said was that it doesn't matter what state you're in, where uh, the efficacy of tobacco taxation would be similar in all states. It's just we're going to use the fact that some states implemented a, taco, a tax and others did not as a kind of natural experiment. Did I answer your question? Other questions? Yeah. Some of it is going to be due to death by attrition, but I have to go back and look exactly at, at the gradation. I think some of those people have quit over the life course. So there, there's various reasons why different age groups have different prevalences. And also, there's a historical effect. So for example, 30 years ago, the 65-year-olds, the people who were then 65, might have been smoking at higher rates than the people that were then 20, because the young people hadn't yet started smoking, for example. So there are different, different things that contribute to that. Yes, up in the balcony. What do I think about medical marijuana? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not asking that to be like a key teenager. I'm just curious. Yeah, OK. No, I'll, I'll take your question at face value. Um, uh, 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 marijuana, the tetrahydrocannabinol, the active ingredient marijuana, is a very powerful anti-emetic. I used to use it all the time as a hospice doctor to reduce, relieve people's uh, nausea. And it was extremely powerful. And the drug, of course, when you smoke marijuana, you don't get, just get the THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol. Like tobacco, you get all these other things. And all of those things combined, not just the THC, but other things now delivered by smoking, it's almost as good as injecting it. When you smoke it, it gets very fast, as I alluded to earlier, can have a variety of uh, beneficial effects. For example, in glaucoma, uh, in, um, and uh, not just the anti-emetic effects uh, with respect to uh, uh, cancer chemotherapy and the like. So in principle, I have no problem with the use of marijuana for medical reasons. I actually, I wouldn't say I have no problem with the use of marijuana as a recreational drug, because that's not true. But I can say from a harm reduction point of view, vastly more injuries and damage is caused by alcohol consumption and by tobacco than by marijuana consumption. So you know, if I had to prioritize my uh, public health dollars, I wouldn't put marijuana at the top of my list. That's not, please don't leave this crowd and say, Yale professor says it's fine to smoke dope at Yale. It's <laughs> <laughs> not what I'm saying. Uh, just sort of in a very scientific way of framing uh, the issue. Did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah. yeah, in the back of it. 
Yeah, so we're going to get to e-cigarettes in just a moment. That's a really good question. Yeah, in the middle. What, I'm sorry, what was your name? Ted. Ted, yeah, and your name is? Ruben. Ruben, yeah. So I'm wondering, Europe has like a lot of uh, more straight regulations of like double stuff, like complete food and whatnot, but in the case of smoking, I'm like, like everyone's not in Europe, you know? Yes. I don't know the answer to that. That's a really good question. And if you, after class, if you snoop around and you find that there must be someone who's published papers on European approach to tobacco reduction and compared it to American uh, policy. So I, I know a fair amount about American policy. I can confirm what you said, which is the prevalence is higher in Europe. Uh, but I don't know, and that's an interesting contrast you made between their approach to tobacco versus their whole approach to food. Uh, but I don't know the, the actual uh, reasons. Now, of course, there have also been warnings in a counter-marketing vein on cigarette packs as well. This is a, these are, this is a progression uh, from Australia. So uh, in 1972, there's a small text warning here at the bottom about what tobacco does. In 1987, it becomes bigger. Uh, by 1995, you have a bolder label that are on, on the front and the back. Smoking causes lung cancer. And then in the back, it's in the, in by 2006 in Australia, the warning must consume 30% of the front and 90% of the back. And they add smoking causes blindness, plus this creepy little uh, image here. Uh, and then by the 2012, the entire pack is covered with warnings. Smoking causes lung cancer. Here's Brian, dead at age 34. Look at him, he's emaciated. Like the images we saw, you didn't see those images because we had to skip the death lecture. But I had some images. In the first lecture, I showed you some pictures like this. Here's Brian before, here he is after. Here in bold yellow is another warning. The whole pack, it's like, you can't, if you're going to smoke, you can't avoid seeing this counter-marketing effort, right? And this is legislatively mandated. Obviously, the seller of the tobacco doesn't want to do any of this. And in between 1981 and 2012 in Australia, the price of a pack of cigarette also uh, tripled. So Australia is trying hard to do everything at once. Really very aggressive uh, counter-marketing on the labels. This is not counter-marketing in the ordinary sense that we tend to think of it like the idea of using humor and sex and those kinds of things, like the same marketing techniques to undo them. But it is nevertheless a kind of marketing now using fear, for instance, to try to get people to stop. And you can even put these ads on the cigarettes themselves, like as you're smoking, smoking kills. Uh, you know, it printed, you can mandate that it's printed on, uh, on every uh, cigarette. And counter-marketing can also cleverly exploit disgust uh, here in street art or in performance art. So here is a rather clever uh, street, art, street artist who paints a sewer to be the mouth of a smoker and the little railing right next to it, the hands you can see. Very inventive kind of graffiti. One can begin to think, incidentally, about things one might do at Yale, not just about this, but other public health problems. What are inventive, non-destructive ways to try to change local norms at Yale about whatever public health problems there might be, whether it's medical marijuana or something else uh, that might be of concern to people? And here's one of my favorite counter-marketing campaigns with respect to tobacco. So just look at this video. Pay attention, because it's hard to hear sometimes what they're saying. <laughs> hideous hairy backs, and, uh, and they paint the hair removal, and they write out cigarettes. You probably didn't see it, because it's tough to see. Let me go back and play it again. On the backs of the men, they spell cigarettes. And these are not Brad Pitt figures, right? So yeah, so you, this is, would be an example of counter-marketing uh, here deployed with respect to tobacco. And in short, creative mass media campaigns can have an effect, but as we saw, they're outgunned. As we saw in your readings, they're often outgunned. So if you put all the budget for smoking counter-marketing together, it's like a drop in the barrel, uh, in the bucket, 
complaint compared to the actual marketing that's taking place pushing the products. And mass media campaigns have been a major tool of health promotion and disease prevention, but the campaigns operate in a crowded informational environment and, as I said, are outgunned by the people trying to sell you these products. The combined annual advertising expenditures by tobacco companies exceeds 10 billion, but the counter-marketing is just a tiny, nothing compared to that. And the use of reinforcing strategies such as legislation, regulation, or building community coalitions may lead to an even greater impact uh, in, this, in this situation. So you don't want to just use counter-marketing, you want to use other things as well. Um, Now let's take a look at law. So we talked now about we talked about taxation, we talked about counter-marketing. Let's now look at some legislative public policy initiatives one might use in response to this public health epidemic. Uh, these are laws prohibiting indoor smoking. And these laws were driven by the phenomenon of secondhand tobacco exposure and the illnesses arising from it. And over the last 20 years or so, more and more states have passed comprehensive clean indoor air laws prohibiting smoking in virtually all public and private workplaces throughout the states, including restaurants, bars, and hotels. And clean indoor air laws should cover all public places with special emphasis on healthcare institutions, schools, daycare centers, and workplaces. And all schools and childcare facilities that receive federal aid have been smoke-free environments since 1995. And these laws have been shown to be very effective. So they reduce smoking prevalence by between 5 and 10% when you pass a law like this. 26.4% of smokers who work in communities with strong ordinances quit smoking within six months compared to 19% of those in areas with no ordinance. So the law is able to uh, increase from 20 to 25%, uh, a 25% a, um, a increase, a 5 percentage point increase in smoking cessation when you pass the law. And a smoking ban in Helena, Montana, produced a 40% decrease in hospital admissions for acute heart attacks over a six-month period. Like an immediate effect uh, in terms of people having heart attacks showing up at the hospital tracked uh, in this study. And finally, let's turn uh, to some techniques. That's laws. And so finally, let's turn to some techniques that can be used on individual patients uh, and pick up on the uh, electronic cigarette example that was brought up uh, a little while ago. As we saw earlier, of the 46 or 50 million smokers in the United States, 70% would like to quit, but each year they have a less than 5% chance of quitting without assistance. And the odds of successfully quitting can be substantially increased, doubled or even tripled, by counseling, so you give this person who wants to quit counseling, nicotine replacement, so you replace the nicotine in a kind of harm reduction approach, they're just going to get that, but none of the other stuff, Drugs, you prescribe medication for them to reduce their cravings, or quit lines, a kind of a public health service uh, used to be used to call someone. Now you can use online tools to help people uh, quit. And counseling can be very effective, especially if financial incentives are also applied. For example, one study showed that providing financial incentives of up to $750 increased quit rates in one year from 5% to nearly 15%. So if you pay people 750 bucks, you can get them to quit smoking, triple the probability that they'll quit uh, within a year. And nicotine replacement is available in an amazing variety of forms, in gum and lozenges, in a patch, an inhaler, in nasal spray, and in uh, little electronic cigarettes. And quit lines are a very cheap uh, thing and have a very high marginal return. Uh, and they're, in they're increasingly going quite high tech, actually, with internet equivalents uh, to quit lines. So you can log on in a way and get support for your smoking cessation uh, intervention. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, with respect to drugs, uh, insurance companies up until recently tended not to cover drugs to help you quit. But that's changing slowly. In the last 10 years, for example, Medicare uh, for the elderly has begun to provide reimbursement for paying for prescription drugs that help reduce the craving and facilitate the ability of people uh, to quit. Here's one online tool that was invented by uh, Dean Carlin, a professor of economics here at Yale. It was called stick.com, and, uh, and it was prompted by an experience he had when he was, I think, at MIT, and he and one of his colleagues made a very large bet as to whether or not they'd be able to achieve uh, a personal goal, I think, of weight loss, uh, uh, like $5,000. Like, you and I are going to contract to lose weight, and if, if you lose weight and I don't, I have to give you five grand, 
you lose weight and I do, you don't lose weight and I do, you give me five grand, we both lose weight, it cancels the bet. And that's really powerful motivation for me to lose weight. I'm gonna give you five, I don't wanna give you five grand. Uh, so they took this online and it says take a contract out on yourself where you can set a goal for yourself, you bind yourself, you pay some money, you have a various procedures for enforcing the contract uh, and this can be very uh, effective. Uh, and these types of approaches, like the nicotine replacement approach, sort of adopts what is known in public health as a harm reduction approach, and it's highlighted in, uh, in one of your readings. Harm reduction focuses on reducing the harmful consequences, of, for example, of recreational drug use, rather than necessarily trying to eliminate the use. It says, look, we can't stop people from using, but how can we make it at least less harmful? And examples include things like needle exchange programs to reduce the transmission of HIV, give away free clean needles, designated driver campaigns for alcohol use, say, look, we can't stop everyone from drinking, but let's at least prevent them from killing themselves by educating drunks and non-drunks uh, that you should rise to the occasion and drive your friends. Or if you're drunk, there's no shame in letting your friends drive you, for example. And the harm reduction approach has not been so widely used with respect to tobacco use. And nicotine replacement therapies have aimed at cessation rather than at reducing harms. But e-cigarettes could potentially be a harm reduction a strategy. And a potentially new frontier uh, of nicotine replacement, and many people are thinking about this right now. Uh, nicotine, this, the e-cigarette delivers nicotine via battery-powered vaporization. There's no combustion of the tobacco. So you don't get all the other stuff from incomplete combustion, like the carbon monoxide and everything else. It's much safer than conventional cigarettes. You also, for example, can't light fires with it. And it mimics the act of smoking, so people tend to find it more acceptable, and could assist with overcoming behavioral as well as, well as pharmacological dimensions of addiction. So one of the reasons I often have difficulty in giving up this vice of mine is that uh, it's not just the caffeine in it that I like, but it's like the whole feeling like of having, holding a cold can. Like I come to a, so you know what I'm talking about, right? It's that cold, it has to be cold. Like it has to be really ice cold, it feels great to hold this ice cold can. That's the same thing with the person with the, with the smoking. They have the whole rhythm that they're moving, it's a kind of ritualized practice, but maybe you can replace that by giving them uh, the e-cigarette and reduce uh, the harm. And companies are using rather inventive campaigns. So look at this woman, she says, dear smoking ban, you know, here's a finger, uh, using the electronic uh, uh, cigarette, here's rewrite the rules, this woman in whatever kind of attire, here take back your freedom, because these products tend not to be prohibited uh, as much. And e-cigarettes are rapidly expanding in use. Use among adults in the United States has increased from 0.6% in 2009 to 2.7% in 2010 in just one year and have continued to rise since then. In 2013, 6.2% of adults and 21.2% of smokers had tried e-cigarettes. And the number of never smoking youth who used e-cigarettes increased from 79,000 in 2011 to more than 263,000 in 2013. So there's very rapid growth in the use of e-cigarettes right now. But the question comes up, and is always debated with any of these harm reduction campaigns, is are e-cigarettes replacing cigarettes, or are they recruiting more non-smokers to the fold? And that's the tension from a public health point of view. So what we want is we want to use, if you're going to smoke, do an e-cigarette instead, but if you're not going to smoke, don't use an e-cigarette and how to get that rightly calibrated so we don't increase the number of people and cause more harm while reducing the number of people who are harming themselves is the balance with these harm reduction uh, campaigns. All right, so let's look a little bit very briefly at alcohol and then, uh, and then we'll close with some remarks about guns uh, and then one sort of big idea that's very important that I communicate to you today. Alcohol is a risk for all sorts of problems and binge drinking is a particular problem in young men uh, though it has been declining. So this is binge drinking among US high school students and adults by sex from 1993 to 2009. Uh, so here we look at boys and girls and men and women. Uh, young boys, or so adolescent boys, are at the highest percentage of binge drinkers, although they've been coming down across time. They're all, the next highest is girls, uh, the next highest after that is men, and the lowest is women, but you know, mature women don't engage in this practice. Uh, and although they're rising a little bit here on the tail end, binge drinking seems to be rising in popularity uh, among women. And overall, alcohol use imposes a substantial public health burden, even on people your age. 
these statistics are illustrated by one of the readings that I gave you that talks very powerfully about the impact of, some, of alcohol consumption on college campuses. Here's one summary of some of the harms. Roughly 1,825 college students aged 18 to 24 die every year from alcohol-related injuries. Roughly 600,000 suffer injuries short of death. Roughly 700,000 students are assaulted by another student who has been drinking, and roughly the same number are drinking themselves, increasing the risk of victimization. So either when you're drunk, you might assault others. When you're drunk, you might be assaulted by others. Either way, it's not a good idea uh, to be that drunk if you have no control over what you're doing. An estimated 97,000 students are victims of alcohol-related sexual assault every year, and a total of 19% of students met criteria for alcohol abuse or dependence, but only 5% sought treatment uh, in this statistical survey of the country. An estimated over 3 million of students drive under the influence of alcohol every year, not only exposing themselves to death, but exposing others uh, to fatalities because of their uh, choices. So there's a heavy burden of binge drinking and alcohol consumption in young people in this country. Now I'd like to make a few remarks about firearms uh, in public health, because from my point of view, firearms are also a lethal product, like tobacco, uh, and can be seen from a public health point of view. Actually using this product, even though it's illegally obtained, just like cigarettes can, you, can result in you killing yourself or killing others. And firearm homicide rates for young men in the United States are 12 to 7 are between 12 and 273 times the rates of other industrialized nations, whereas non-firearm homicide rates are only between 1.4 and 9.2 times greater in the United States than other countries. So this slide shows the mechanism of homicides in young people in diverse countries. So here's, here's, uh, here's what's happening in Canada, the overall number of homicides. Here's, here's people who are killed by firearm. This is like Clue, you know, uh, Mr. Must, Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the, in the living room. Uh, so here is a firearm, here is cutting and piercing, and here's all other causes in Canada. Here's England and Wales, less in France, here's Israel, here's Norway, here's Scotland, and here's the United States, right? I mean, we're off the charts in terms of how many people we are killing. But interestingly, the real bang for the buck is from firearms. So it's not that we are uh, more homicidal, though we are slightly more homicidal than these other countries. It's that we are especially homicidal in our use of guns. So now why, why is this difference important between a gun and non-gun, this difference across countries in gun and non-gun homicides? What intellectual point is made by those data? Anyone? Yeah? Yes, it's exactly right. What's your name? Sarah. Sarah, yeah. So that's right. So what data like this suggest to people, scientists, when they look at these data, is that what's happening is the availability of guns is making it possible for, possible for us to kill more people, not that we are more homicidal. Right? Because we're not becoming more homicidal and going on killing people with knives. Something about gun availability is contributing to this epidemic of gun deaths since we're so out of whack compared to other countries. And guns have not replaced other violence. Uh, it's not as guns have, have, uh, have not replaced other violence. Uh, it's not as if we are somehow intrinsically more violent. In 1986, there were 1,043 gun homicides in males aged 15 to 19 in the United States, whereas there were six in all of Canada, and two in Japan. We have 500 times the rate of young people killing each other in our country compared to Japan. 500 times. And here's some data, uh, as I said, of young people in different uh, countries. Um, so, uh, and here's some data that was taken from your readings from the Kellerman study, um, which gives you a feel for the frequency and age and race distribution of not just deaths, but more broadly, injuries due to firearms in the United States. And this study defined an injury as resulting from the discharge of a firearm that required emergency medical attention. And overall, in the three city study, which were Seattle, Memphis, and Galveston, Texas, there were between 110 and 160 injuries due to firearms per 100,000 people per year, or somewhat over one per thousand people per year. And 88% of these injuries were during an assault, 7% during suicide attempts, and 4% were accidental injuries. 
But overall, 19% of the injuries were fatal. But look at the variation uh, by age and race and ethnicity. So this shows firearm-related injuries in three cities according to various groups. The age has been pooled. So this is now the number of cases per 100,000. And if you look at this, you see that males are at greater risk than females at all age groups. Even young kids are more, men, boys are more likely to be shot uh, than girls. Um, and that blacks are at greater risk than uh, uh, black males are, so this is for non-Hispanic whites, uh, amongst blacks, again, men are at greater risk than women. But if you look at black males age 15 to 29, they have like an astronomically higher risk of being victims of homicide compared to any other cell in this uh, uh, group. You know, if you could compare black men to black women, or black men to non-Hispanic white men, or any other uh, category. So there's an extraordinary patterning of this uh, epidemic as well in our society. Men are obviously more violent than women, but they're also more likely to be the victims of violence, and this peaks in their youth. And the burden in minority populations is enormous. We're going to come back to some additional risks when we talk about networks later on, talking about the work of Andrew Papakristos in the sociology department here, uh, and rather cool work on, on, on uh, victimization due to uh, guns. And numerous epidemiological studies of diverse designs confirm that gun availability increases successful suicides and homicides, and hence death. So this slide shows the rate of household firearm ownership and rates of suicides, firearm suicide, and non-firearm suicide in seven northeastern states. Vermont, my home state, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Jersey. Here's the percent of households with firearms. Here's the suicides per thousand. Here's the firearm suicides per thousand, and here are the non-firearm suicides per thousand. And what you can see is that the non-firearm suicides per thousand are roughly constant across all the states. But the firearm suicides per thousand are higher in the states that have more guns. So what the argument is that what the guns are doing is not increasing your interest in killing yourselves. What the guns are doing is increasing your ability to kill yourself when you want to kill yourself. Again, like the situation we introduced at the first lecture of the jumping off the bridge, if we remove the guns, if we change the structure, we'll help prevent people from killing themselves. It's not like they're just going to go and find another mechanism. And it should be possible to treat guns as a threat to public safety and to regulate them. And there would appear to be much support for this, uh, as shown in your readings. So this is support among respondents for regulating guns as consumer products, looking uh, in the United States, looking at all respondents, or even just looking at gun owners. Gun owners know that guns are dangerous. They have rather sensible ideas about gun safety. Government regulations of gun design, everyone thinks that's reasonable. Same standards for domestic guns is more important. Imported guns, no reason there should be a difference. Everyone agrees. Child proofing of new handguns, slight disagreement, but still the majority of Americans think it's good. Personalization of handguns, magazine safety for all pistols, loaded chamber indicator for all new handguns. Right, a lot of people kill themselves every year. You know, Darwin Award winners showing their girlfriend, look what it's like, I'm putting my gun in my mouth. Bang, and they forget that there's a, a bullet in the chamber. Maybe an indicator would help reduce those kinds of fatalities. And in the 1950s, efforts to reduce motor vehicle injuries focused on the driver and the data about motor vehicle accidents were interpreted to suggest that almost all automobile crashes were caused by error on the driver's part. And the greatest attention was thus paid to education and enforcement, training motorists to drive better and punishing them for committing safety violations. And this is similar to the problem of medical harm and patient safety movements we described earlier. We're actually we're saying, well, maybe humans are human. They're going to make mistakes when they drive. Maybe we shouldn't be focusing on the agency of the driver. Maybe we should be focusing on the structure around the driver. And after the 1950s, attitudes towards motor vehicle accidents began to change. There was a shift in the focus from agency to a focus on structure. Because injury control experts recognized that to increase the safety of driving, it would be much more cost effective to try to change the vehicle and the highway environment rather than change human behavior. And so numerous alternations began and were made in cars and in roads to make collisions less likely, better brakes. We divided our highways in this country so oncoming traffic wasn't heading towards each other. And to make serious injuries more avoidable if there was a collision, 
For example, collapsible steering columns became mandated in cars, or breakaway signs, so that if you crash into a sign, it's not a rigid surface, it gives away. So we say, people are gonna crash anyway, let's change the structure, let's not focus so much on the agency. Um, or emergency medical systems, let's make it so we get people faster when they're injured uh, to hospitals. No one believes that today's drivers are more careful than the drivers from the 1950s. Yet the number of motor vehicle fatalities per mile has been reduced by more than 75% in the last 60 years. And firearms, like motor vehicles, lawnmowers, and chainsaws, are consumer products that can cause injury. The safety of virtually every consumer product is regulated by federal or state government, and the conspicuous exception is the gun. Unfortunately, as Hemingway points out in your readings, because firearms have been deliberately exempted from the oversight of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, we are in the indefensible and preposterous position of having stronger consumer protection standards for toy guns, and even actually for teddy bears, than we have for real guns. There are more rules governing what you can do in terms of manufacturing a squirt gun than what you can do manufacturing a real pistol in our society. And the reason, of course, is that a powerful lobby interferes with common sense here. In 1996, uh, Republican members of Congress tried to defund the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. And this did not carry, but the House cut its budget and signed into law that none of the funds made available for injury prevention and control at the CDC may be used to advocate or promote gun <coughs> control. And this restriction was extended to all Department of Health and Human Services agencies, and succeeding laws were passed until the Obama administration issued a presidential memorandum in 2013 directing the CDC and other agencies just to research gun violence, not even to pass any rigid legislation. Why should we legislate ourselves into ignorance? I mean, these were laws that were passed to stop us from acquiring information, not laws that were passed that were to stop us from regulating guns. And this disparity in spending between research and this cause of death is striking, even when compared to motor vehicle accidents. So here's the matchup between years of potential life lost and US public health spending for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and stroke. There's some correspondence between how deadly the conditions are and how much money we spent. Here's the case of motor vehicle accidents, how deadly they are and how much money we spend. And here's guns. We spend almost nothing uh, understanding that guns as a cause of death despite the fact that it's a leading killer in our society. And you can see this impact on research in a number of ways. Uh, here are uh, total academic publications in millions rising across time. Here are publications on firearm violence falling during the period. So scientists abandon research on guns or begin to abandon it beginning in the 1990s when funding for this research winds down. A kind of deliberate, self-imposed ignorance about what guns might do. And here's some common sense recommendations by America's mayors, how we might actually respond. Uh, here, we're just talking not about doing anything about guns, just acquiring knowledge about guns. Removing policy riders on federal appropriation bills that limit firearm research. Fully funding the National Violent Death Reporting System and expanding it so we can understand who's dying from guns. Reconstituting the research program on gun trafficking at the National Institute of Justice to update and expand our understanding of the market for illegal guns. Resuming publications at the Justice Department, rescinding the tire, tire uh, amendments, and expanding the bulk sale reporting program for assault weapons to include all 50 states, so that if you sell assault weapons in bulk, you've got to tell someone that that's what you're doing. Really commonsensical kinds of uh, information collection uh, uh, strategies. And finally, here's another well-known case of how structure can affect agency, similar to the gun example. For a variety of, this is a very famous case in public health. For a variety of reasons related to how natural gas was produced in this time period, shifting from coal uh, to North Sea sources, the carbon monoxide content of the natural gas declined. So here's the time period, and here's the percentage of carbon monoxide in the natural gas that was provided to people in England. And here's what happened to the suicide rates by mode of death in England. So here is what, among males, Here's the rate of suicide. It's declining, and the non-carbon monoxide suicides stay constant, but the carbon monoxide suicides decline. So just like the gun suicide example between states that I told you, this is a study that looks within a country at an and a natural experiment where we remove the carbon monoxide from the natural gas. Suicide rate stays roughly the same, but I've taken away the gun. 
I've made it harder for you to kill yourself in this kind of a situation. So, the sort of overarching point I'd like to leave you with, leave you with today is the following. How can we affect public health change? What is a useful way to modify structure so that we can change individual behaviors? This is a cartoon of how water was drawn for use in many households in London in the middle of the 19th century. And there's a very, very famous piece of data analysis performed by John Snow at that time period. There was an outbreak of cholera which occurred in the Soho district of London in and around Broad Street in 1854. And some elements of this story are disputed, but I'm going to tell you the conventional version. Because John Snow reasoned that if cholera was spread by a mist spreading through the air, as the prevailing theories then suggested, then the cases should be uniformly distributed along the streets. And to see if this was the case, he plotted each cholera case on a map. And as can be seen here, so each of these, these are the street fronts, each of these little black lines is one cholera case. So here's, here's a house with some cholera cases next door to their house with that cholera. Here's some cholera cases. Here's some cholera cases. Here's some cholera cases. Here's a ton of them. And right there, shown in the red arrow, was the Broad Street pump, the pump where Londoners went to get their water. And Snow went to this pump, and he said, my goodness, there's a concentration of cholera cases near the pump. He goes to the pump, and he takes a sample of water, and he looks at it under the microscope, and he sees that it contains a bacteria that he has not seen before. And he guesses that this bacteria might be responsible. And he went back to the pump, famously, and he took the handle off the Broad Street pump. He took the handle off the Broad Street pump, and the Broad Street cholera epidemic stopped just like that. Stopped, because he intervened in the structure and affected what was happening in this population. And it would be great if we could have a handle on the Broad Street pump for many of the collective threats to public health we've been reviewing today. And in many cases, we do. We can adjust the structure and not just the agency. When it comes to accidents, we can think about roadway design. When it comes to smoking, we can think about how cigarettes are marketed and how they're taxed and where they're available. When it comes to firearm deaths, we can think about gun availability. And when it comes to obesity, we can think about school lunches, soft drink machines in elementary schools, the design of our cities, and much else besides. Because there's so many things about our society that we can intervene on and affect in diverse sorts of ways that help human beings have better public health. That's it for today. Any questions before I let you go? See you next time.